Welcome to the Department of Theology and Religious Studies. With me today is Dr. Margaret Barker, who has done a vast amount of work on how the Old Testament affected the understanding of the first Christians and the importance of understanding the Old Testament to understanding the first followers of Jesus. One of the strange things as we read the documents left behind by the first followers of Jesus is the prominence that the temple has in the life of Jesus. Mm. He's presented in the temple mm -hmm. as a little child. He's found in the temple as a 12 year old. Mm. He sets his face towards Jerusalem mm. and then goes and is with them in the temple teaching. And Christians are always interested in this. How important is the temple in Christian origins? It's vital. I mean, the Christians saw themselves as the successors to the temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed in AD 70. And although we can't date the first letter of Peter with any certainty, Peter actually says, you know, become the living stones of the spiritual temple. So the Christians did identify themselves as mm. the temple, as a community. And of course, this the, the idea of living stones, this, the, the, <coughs> we, we often use this phrase, the living stones, and we think of it building, building mm. the, the great edifice. But actually the edifice for one Peter is the edifice of the new temple. Absolutely, it's the new temple. And there was a lot of disquiet in the time of Jesus about the state of the actual temple. Um, many people, you know, pious, traditional believers, they looked at the compromises that were being made with Roman authority, doubtless for all sorts of good political expediency, and they thought, well, we don't like this. And of course, the one of the most dramatic moments in the synoptic gospels is when Jesus goes, oh, and in John's gospel as well, he goes into, Jesus goes into the temple and he drives out all the money changers and he cleanses the temple. And it's, it's, it's more than symbolic this. This is a way of saying all this old corruption has had its day. And then Jesus' followers identified themselves, first of all, just as a community, as the new temple. But then later on, when they were, much later on, when they were in a powerful enough position to build their own permanent places of worship, these were built like temples. And the liturgy, the form of Christian worship that developed was actually based on the, literally the shape of temple worship. And this was very important. I think many Christians use, let me give you an example. In Irish, one of the words you can use for a church building is temple, yeah. which just is a, a, a transliteration into Irish of the word templum in Latin, mm. temple. What is, the, what, is the, what is the idea behind a temple? Because we use the word temple for the temple in Jerusalem, but there was all the other temples what is behind the idea of temple? Well, the idea of temple is actually set out in the command given to Moses at Sinai, uh, where the forerunner of the temple was constructed. And this was the desert tabernacle. This was a tent. It had to be portable. <clears throat> but this was the blueprint for a temple. And the commandment was, build me a holy place that I may dwell in your midst. And so the temple itself was symbolically a sign of the presence of God in the midst of the community. And then within the temple itself, the presence of God was more specifically located in what is now the sanctuary of a church, but in the temple was called the Holy of Holies. And this most holy place, it's the same Hebrew, most holy and holy of holies are the same. This was deemed to be uh, symbolic of the presence of God, not only in the midst of the community, but also in the midst of the whole creation. Because a Jewish temple, the temple in Jerusalem or the tabernacle before it, 
this was symbolic of the whole creation. So the, the temple is not just the place of the encounter of the people with God. No. It is the place which forms a centre for the, for the universe. Yes. Is, is, that, is that what we get? Is, the, is that the idea that lies behind Ezekiel 5.5? 5, 5, that, you know, the, the temple has been set in the midst of the nations. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The idea of the temple and the Holy of Holies as the absolute centre, very, very important indeed. And when the temple was, or when the tabernacle was erected, it was erected symbolically as reenacting creation that we see in Genesis chapter 1. And that's why it has to be arranged to north, south, east and oh, west. Oh yes, it has to be properly aligned. and Things have to be placed in the tabernacle in the right order. You see this in the Exodus chapter 40, the very last part of the book of Exodus. And there it's quite clear that what happens on the second day of creation, <clears throat> that's when the firmament is put in place and, and Moses erects the veil of the tabernacle then and separates off the Holy of Holies. And then on the on the fourth day, it's the lights of heaven, and on the fourth process, he puts the candlestick in place. So everything is symbolic. But the important part of this symbolism is that the origin, the very beginning of creation, the source of all life, that is symbolized by the Holy of Holies, and that is the, you can't say the place, perhaps the state of the presence of God from which all life comes forth. And of course, that's the great story in the Christian book of Revelation. It very much is the story in the Christian book of Revelation because the, the stage set for the book of Revelation is the heavenly temple. And all the things that happen in the book of Revelation are what people would have imagined happening within temple worship, particularly the uh, rituals that happened on the Day of Atonement when um, the Lord comes forth from the holy place, he comes forth in judgment, he judges all the sinners and he, then he re-establishes the creation and the kingdom and so forth. So the book of Revelation is a drama woven around the greatest um, ritual, I suppose you'd say, in the ancient temple. I have two questions for you. The first one is, in, in the great prologue to John's Gospel, there's this strange description of the coming of the Logos among us as the human mm -hmm. being, mm -hmm. uh, coming among us as Jesus, that he pitched his tent. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's always a tendency to just think of that as just sort of a, well, it's a very sort of nice matter. But actually, pitching your tent, it, it actually means a lot more in John. Oh yes, it's temple imagery because the original temple was, of course, a tent that was pitched by Moses in the, in the wilderness. And one of the problems that Old Testament scholars face is that because the temple in Jerusalem, this great stone edifice, was consciously related to the tabernacle, descriptions of the tabernacle have seeped into descriptions of the temple and vice versa. So it's very difficult to disentangle the two, but as a rule of thumb, you can use the one for the other. So in a sense, the body of Jesus, the reality of his humanity, yeah. is the temple of the Logos. Yes, and this is further elaborated by some very interesting temple imagery that passes straight into early Christian storytelling. Now, the second day of creation was when the firmament was uh, put in place to separate what is above from what is below, that's Genesis. Mm. Then in the tabernacle, you have the veil put in place to separate what, what is most holy from what is holy, that's how Genesis, uh, Exodus describes it. Now, this veil was woven from four coloured threads, red, blue, purple and white. And these represented the four elements from which the ancient world believed matter was composed. And so what you have in that veil is a very interesting symbol of the divine presence beyond matter. Now we do know that in the ancient temple, that form of fabric that represents matter was also used for the outer 
ceremonial vestment of the high priest. Now the high priest wore a white linen undergarment and that represented his angel presence because the high priest was an angel presence. But when he functioned outside the Holy of Holies, he covered his angel presence with a garment that represented matter. And so very early on, people saw in the temple vestments of the high priest a foreshadowing, a parable, if you like, of the idea of incarnation. And the early Christian story is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, worked as a temple weaver. And while she was pregnant with her child, she was weaving in both senses a veil of the temple. And people picked this up and they said, well, isn't that amazing? The incarnation of Jesus is somebody coming from the divine state beyond the veil. And then, like the high priest had foreshadowed, he takes human flesh. And of course, that story is found in the second century text, the Protevangelium of James. Yes, indeed. And indeed, we have, we've, we've actually made a video on, on, that very, on that very text. And um, on a better known text, of course, Charles Wesley's Christian uh, Christmas Carol, Veiled in Flesh the Godhead See. Hail the incarnate deity. Now, a lot of people have sung that at Christmas, and I wonder how many people really ever thought, hmm, what does that mean? Well, that's what it means. It's all about the temple veil. One of the questions that comes up about the temple veil, at the moment when Jesus yields up his spirit, the veil of the temple is ripped in two. In two. Mm. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, Hebrews tells us this, that the veil represents the flesh of our Lord. That's the incarnation thing again. And so as he dies, so the temple veil is torn. Now, for practical purposes, people say, well, how could... I mean, the temple veil was huge. It was a heavy wool and linen fabric. How could it have torn? It would have been very difficult to tear it. Well, the answer is two answers. That one is that the temple veil was not woven as one piece of fabric. It was woven as 72 strips, which were then joined together for purely practical reasons. I mean, how do you make a huge piece of cloth? What is likely to have happened is the earthquake caused tremors and a line of stitching gave way. Is much more likely, if you're being strictly practical about these things, mm. but the symbolism is that the veil of the temple was torn in two and the Holy of Holies was therefore open. And so the presence of God was no longer veiled. This is why, to come back to what you said earlier, St. John's prologue, we have beheld the glory. That's what John was talking about, because the glory of the Lord, its sort of natural place, was in the Holy of Holies. One, can, I, can I give a plug for a book here? Uh, we, people will say, how do you know what the temple meant at the time of Jesus? The one I, the one I recommend immediately is when I get that from, yeah. uh, whenever I get that question, I immediately say, okay, writing just a generation later, Josephus, yeah. he gives us in his Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the first books of the Antiquities, he gives us the story of the, of the, of the, 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 the tent in the wilderness and what it mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. Is the key to understanding what the first, is one of the keys to understanding what the first Christians thought about the temple, to go and read, and, and not just about the temple, but about things that were done in the temple, like sacrifice and the, and the role of sacrifice. Do, do you agree? Do you agree, would you agree with me that we should give a plug to Josephus and those early books of the antiquities that we so often ignore? And indeed the Jewish war sections on the temple as well. Yes, but you have to read Josephus with, with a kind of um, reader's warning. Okay. Caveat emptor. Because Josephus, although he came from a priestly family himself and would have known all about the traditions of the temple, he was also a traitor to his people. And so he had 
quite a nasty skewed agenda, to be honest. Most of what he says about the temple, I'm sure, is authentic. But the secret meanings of the temple, if you read in other texts, should never have been revealed to anyone. These were called the secrets of beyond the veil, which were the property, if you like, only of the high priesthood. So Josephus betrayed his high priestly family by writing this. He had an agenda, as I said. But by doing this, he has given us a key to going in and looking at all sorts of things, including allusions in early Christian texts. And we can say, ah, so mm. that's where this Christian custom came from. Nobody ever spoke about it. You, you go as far as the fourth century and St. Basil the Great, and he's still talking about things that are handed down unwritten from the apostles. And when you look at what those are, these are all temple traditions, using oil, marking with the cross, facing east to pray, all these sorts of things. None of that is in the New Testament. And people who want to be strictly Bible-based Christians would look at other traditional churches and they say, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. It's not in the New Testament. Well, it wasn't. But St. Basil can say this was handed down unwritten. And the unwritten material was the temple tradition of the high priesthood. And Josephus, for all he was a traitor, and I don't think I would have liked him at all, he does give us the key to these temple secrets. I have to say, um, myself and Josephus are good. Pa I, I really do like him. You like him. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Margaret, thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you.